everybody. Hi, welcome to the Science of Visual Analytics session. My name is Jacelyn Lim. And my name is Benjamin Tan. Today we have uh, a good lineup of topics for you in terms of the science of visual analytics. It's one of our favorite topics that we like to share. <laughs> and so uh, let's see what we have in store, Jacelyn. Yeah, so I think this session will also provide you with more information on why we do certain things we do in Tableau, uh, why analysts sometimes build you charts instead of the tables, uh, mm -hmm. rows and columns of tables that you, you so want it so much. So this session will definitely uh, uh, enlighten you to do that. So without a further ado, let's uh, zoom in directly to the presentation itself. All right, take it away. Yeah, so of course, before we begin, uh, those that uh, have already known Tableau or those who is new to Tableau, uh, for Tableau, we actually help people to see and understand data. So that's where you can easily build your visualizations or uh, look and understand about your data really easily. So this is a core part to our mission and it hasn't changed a bit since uh, the beginning of time. Yeah, so we really want to work with more people uh, to learn about their work with data as well. So before we start uh, this session also, uh, there are some of the things that we will, we will likely repeat many, many times. And uh, everything that you do with regards to sharing insights of your data is relevant to uh, these questions. Like the first questions to ask when you are trying to build a visualization or trying to build a dashboard is uh, firstly, who is your audience? So will the audience understand the kind of charts that you build? And how much data literacy, literacy skills does your audience have? Will your audience be willing to put in those time and effort to actually understand the charts you build? So a dashboard that you build for a five minutes meeting is definitely uh, different from the operational dashboards that you build for uh, your team or your analysts. So that is why uh, you may want to also check if we are building a chart that is relevant to your audience. Yeah. So the next thing to consider is also what is the purpose of visualizing the data? There are so many data and so many important information to present. So the key to helping you to stay focused while building a dashboard is the purpose of your presentation and what you are trying to convey. So this is a bit of the combination of the art and science. It is like you are the journalist, but instead of writing with the words, you are using visual objects like charts to convey a certain message. So in a moment, we are going to go through the science and how to apply that to your data. And our ultimate goal in that is to be able to uh, provide the greatest degree of understanding with the least amount of effort for your largest number of uh, audience or the people that's looking at, at the dashboards. And when we mention about the least number of effort, it's not the least number of effort to build the dashboard, but rather the least number of effort for your audience to understand what you're trying to say. So the best scenario is to really flash the dashboard to your audience and they can understand without asking you any question at all. So at a glance, they are able to uh, really understand what you're trying to, the, the message that you're trying to put through. So that is the ultimate uh, goal that we have and of course, with that in mind, uh, our, def our audience is definitely another human being. Therefore, understanding how the brain works would definitely help us in understanding or trying to structure our dashboard in a way that they can understand. So in order to do that, we need to understand a little bit about our entire cognitive system. So this will be the foundations where we will understand what charts is suitable to convey uh, certain types of information. Mm -hmm. And yes, this is our brain, but don't worry, we are not going to go through the different parts of the brain like we did in biological classes. So what we want to say here is that our brain is a remarkable uh, organ. Since evolution has given us this remarkable organ that connects to our eyes, evolved over a million of years, our minds are wired in a very specific way. And the wiring really helps us to see the environment around us. And that's why we have them. But it also can play a trick on us. 
simply because our brain want to be more efficient in also helping you to see some of the uh, things and make our life easier so that we don't get overwhelmed by too many visual signs that's in the uh, in our surrounding. So here's an example. I'm sure most of you would have came across this similar eye test as well on social media. Can you read it? Yeah, most of us should be able to. So you will also understand that uh, our brain doesn't actually remember every single word. Most of the time, we our brain remembers the similar shape and structure of the words and also perhaps the starting and the ending of each of the uh, spelling of the words. So that is uh, how our brain uh, keeps to be more efficient and not actually remember every single spelling of things. Or another case would be this color of the dress, which caused a huge internet sensation like two or three or even more years ago, whether this is a blue dress or a white dress. Yeah. So there's nothing much we can do to stop the advantages or the pitfalls of our brain because it's simply wired this way. But what we can do, as we'll see in data visualization, is to try to lean things uh, such that we can forwards, uh, focus towards the benefit of the data visualization and avoid, uh, and avoid those pitfalls. As much as our brain is wonderful, it, of course, it can also be uh, flawed. Here's another example. How long does it take for you to notice that there are more than one toothbrush in this image? Yes, there is one enormous toothbrush sitting right there, dominating this entire picture, and yet our brain has chosen not to see it. Our brains can be fooled by what it's looking at as well. And what's happening here is that our brain is trying to understand the contextual information while ignoring things that can be pretty obvious. In our case, uh, we already know the size of the toothbrush and therefore as our brain is scanning through this picture, it's trying to find the very familiar items that we know. And therefore filtering out all the noise in the background. And this is how our brain helps us to be more efficient when we are processing information. Therefore, our brain is flawed, but yet it is definitely also very amazing. So there's another study that goes all the way back to the 1973 by this person named Enscom. He is a famous statistician that created what he called the quartets of groups of numbers to emphasize the importance of graphing data before analyzing it and also to look at the effects of the outliers. So this is the kind of data set that he has on, on uh, this experiment. So it comes with four groups of uh, different data. So all the X and Y looks completely different. However, when He's trying to compute all this together, uh, all the statistical mean of X and Y or correlation, they are actually the same. So as a human being, uh, when we look at this set of numbers, we may not be able to see any kind of patterns uh, from here because the number is really random and it's hard for us to comprehend as well, the different uh, numbers in each cell. Yeah. But however, when we were, if we were to plot this out on the charts, so that's where we will be able to see uh, the effect of, uh, let me change back to cursor. Yeah. So when we uh, plot this out on charts, so we can easily see that group A, uh, this is the pattern of the charts, group B, group C, and group D. So despite having the similar uh, statistical uh, numbers for the four set of data, uh, the shape of each of the curve and data is actually very different. So this is something that the computers cannot help us with because as human beings, when we see these four shapes, we know that they are completely different. But in terms of computers, they recognize data by the, the calculations, the means, they will conclude that this four data set is uh, the same because the mean of X and Y correlation and all that is the same. Yeah, so that's where the 
you that's where his point is that you can't just rely on stats. Our eyes can detect things that machine cannot. So of course, don't worry, we are still really important here when we are doing analytics. Yeah, so moving forward into 2017, so uh, another two uh, users actually come up with uh, the same concept, trying to replicate that same concept. Now, of course, using uh, technology to simulate that. So he has created also uh, the experiment, uh, which he called the Datasaurus Rex. He created a Python program that could also take any image and force it into a scatter plot that have the similar uh, statistical properties. So what you are seeing here for all those images, each and every single one of them also has that same statistical properties. So really the same concept that it's trying to say with the very first guy over in the history. Yeah, so these are the different runs. Likewise, for machine, they could only understand that uh, the mean and the standard deviation, they are all the same. But in terms of the shape of the data, as a human being, we can clearly see that each of them, uh, they are completely different. So both experiments in the 1970s and 2017 have proven that our visual and cognitive minds are really important to the analytical process. And that is why we visualize data instead of looking at the data in the rows and columns. So this is another example when we're trying to look for perhaps the trends and also which is the biggest value. Trying to look at data in the table uh, rows and columns, it's really difficult. So first of all, it is also because for human beings, for our, uh, in terms of memory wise, uh, most of the time we could only remember at max up to seven numbers at a time in our short term memory. So you could imagine by the time you look at the eighth number in this row, you may have already forgotten the first number. And let alone while looking through this set of numbers, your brain is also trying to compare to see if the numbers that you have just read through, is it bigger uh, than the previous value? So then you could find the biggest value. Yeah, so it is uh, numbers, they are not ex actually something that's uh, instinctively known for us as human beings. So things like size, uh, colors, uh, those are the things that uh, even babies can understand. That's what we are born with, our very first instinct. So if you are able to leverage on that, that will also help you a lot in the analytics. Yeah, so that's where if you put the data into a uh, graphical format, we see three lines, we can also very quickly see that there's a dip in the technology space in earlier on in the years, near maybe midpoint of 2013. And it's soon after that, it recovers to be one of the best uh, sales in the 2017. So if we put the both the aspects uh, together, uh, that's where it is much easier to remember the trend of the lines than to remember the actual figures and numbers in the table. So there is this concept that is also called uh, chunking. So when we are looking at the numbers, we are reading each of the fields here, each of the numbers here as one. So we could only remember seven. But if we are looking at images such as the line chart itself, uh, our brain can remember this entire chunk of chart as one. So imagine you could remember like the shape of seven graphs instead of just seven cells here. So that's the concept of uh, chunking. So allows us to actually remember more in our short term memory than individual cells. So it definitely make it more efficient for anyone to be able to visualize the information rather than to present it in a table way. Yeah, so that's actually data visualization. It is totally the representation and presentation of the data that helps to, of course, leverage on our visual perspective perspective uh, ability in order to, of course, amplify cognition to allow your users when they look at the information, they easily understand and are able to spot some outliers. So that's also uh, 
quoting from this uh, data scientist here that's called Andy Kirk. So you could also Google a bit more on him as well if you want to find out uh, more information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now that we have an understanding of also how our brain works, yeah, let's have a go at some of the quick activities here. Okay, can or perhaps you, you guys can also yeah take a guess. How many nines are there in the next screen that I'm also about to share? So let's start with uh, our countdown again. So three, two, one. Okay, how many nines are there in this bunch of uh, jumbled up numbers? Looks really difficult. <laughs> That's a good challenge uh, for a session like this, yeah. 15? To exercise your eyes. Mm, not quite, not quite. But let me help you with uh, making this a bit more uh, easy. Oh, okay. that's really much easier. <laughs> Yes, so it's actually utilizing the uh, colors in order to uh, highlight to you the number of nines here using the color red. And of course, also fading out unimportant information, in this case, the other digits that is in gray. Yeah, so there's about maybe 13 or 11 of them or even 10, but it makes it really easier to uh, count now in this case. <laughs> And again, if we were to present this differently in another manner is that we could count and place them in a bar chart. So now we get even more information other than of course, knowing that there are 13 of the number nines in this data set. We can also know that, oh, it is the third uh, most common number in this whole bunch of uh, random numbers. And the most numbers that appears in this random chart itself is actually 21. So the six uh, number six out there is trying to mess with your eyes to make you confused whether it's a six or a nine. Yeah. So with the different ways of uh, pre representing uh, the information, you could see that we start off with a whole jumbled number and trying to get you to find the number nine. Uh, really difficult because you need to scan through each and every one of the numbers and then put that uh, count in your brain and of course ultimately summing it up. Next is uh, using the colors to highlight to you the important uh, number nines that we are trying to count. And the third one, other than providing you with the total counts for just number nines, it also provide you other information on uh, how, how many number nines uh, are there compared to the rest of the figures and so forth. So we are totally leveraging on things like colors and of course the length of the bar to tell us more information on that. And all these are what we call the pre-attentive attributes. So we utilize things like length, width, size, shape, and even the color schemes in order to uh, do that. And of course, you could easily do that using the Tableau's marks card. It's also drag and drop. So you could imagine now uh, your bar chart, instead of just looking at a single dimension of maybe just the sales, you could also utilize things like the color scheme itself to show, show to you in the same uh, bar, bar graph that uh, what is the profit for the different uh, categories or different segments. So essentially showing two different measures in one single chart using different uh, as attributes and aspects. Save screen space, of course, we only have limited screen space and so many things to show. So that's one good use of the pre-attentive attributes as well, other than of course to uh, be able to capture the attention of your audience ultimately. Mm -hmm. Of course, there also comes another question is, oh, okay, great. I have uh, this many pre-attentive attributes. Then what, what is the, which is the best? <laughs> That's like most of the uh, questions that people will ask also. So which is the best? Which one should I use instead? Very common questions, but of course, not all pre-attentive attributes are built the same or built equal. So let's take a look at uh, two examples. Yeah, so in examples here, uh, we could you could do a guess as well. So we have uh, the left side, we have all the bar charts. If it's like a mathematical question now, so if A is 150, can you guess like the value of D? And similarly, the next uh, set of uh, numbers here, if this biggest circle is 200, 
F is 200. Try guessing the value of H. Yeah, this really sounds like the charts or drawing that uh, charts in, in school days when we are learning about math. It reminds me of those days. Mm -hmm. Okay, so keep that number in mind. So I will now review the answers. Okay, so this study have also been done or, uh, across other uh, webinar sessions. And we have also gathered the guesses and responses. Mm -hmm. So the actual number for this particular bar, it's actually 45. So it's your guess close to that number. And here's what we have populated also in the responses. So out of that well, 1,407 responses, we could see that most people guess uh, somewhere between 40 to 60 with the answer 45. So that's a pretty close guess. Like it's more or less like a five or a bit more or less uh, deviation. So that's great. And you could see that if we are guessing about the size of the bubble, in this case, if this is 200, how much is H? So the answer is 35. Are you close to the answers? Yeah, so if we look at also the distribution of how people are guessing based on the circle itself, we could see like really a great wide variety of uh, answers here. And answers being 35, so you could also see like almost half of them got it wrong. So the chances of guessing uh, the figures if they are in a uh, round shape, it's much uh, difficult than in the bar graph. Yeah, because like, what we have learned in school, we probably would divide this into three blocks and all that and try to draw dotted lines to match that, those mathematics school days. Yeah, those help us to really uh, do a easier guesstimate. Whereas in circle, uh, it is harder to grasp whether how the size of this circle, the angle, how, how is it different from uh, this uh, sample that we have here on uh, 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the point of the exercise is also to show that not all of the pre-attentive attributes are built the same. So if you're talking about the length of the bar, it is much easier to uh, guesstimate more accurately than the size of the bubble. Which also brings me uh, to the point that uh, I, I know most of us do also like a pie chart a lot. So that is where it may be difficult for users to actually understand when you have some slices in your pie chart, especially if it's more than five category. And once you start to need to label each slice of the pie itself, that means it's not uh, visually uh, effective in allowing the users to know the actual value. So it becomes like a spider because it's a round pie with a lot of uh, markers, uh, with a lot of labeling outside that pie. Uh, it's a, a bit of a waste of space because you need to label that and it's not as efficient if you have to label the, the pie itself. So just a note there, if you want to use pie charts, uh, if there is less than five category to slice, that's fine. Anything more than that, perhaps you may want to choose another type of charts. Yeah, so even though the different um, pre-attentive attributes uh, it's use uh, may not be as effective. It doesn't mean that we can't use circle anymore. So uh, the size of the bubble anymore. So this particular example is taken from the Economist and also 2017. Uh, it showcased uh, the number of, in this case, the witchcraft that uh, happens from the 1300s uh, and to all the way to 1850s. So the number of uh, witchcraft trials that uh, each of the countries have actually, they, they believe in that. So they found the witch and if it's a witch, they of course they burn the person or they kill, execute the person. So this is a chart on that. So in this context, both the circle and the bar graph is used uh, together. So the bar chart here shows us the primary information where it is, uh, the key message or the important message is to really let users uh, or viewers know the accuracy of how many is being accused versus how many is executed. And the secondary information that uh, supplements this is uh, displayed using the size of the bubble. 
where now we can see that most of the about 980 of the uh, people per 100,000 uh, people that's on trial in Switzerland. Uh, these are the number of uh, witchcraft trials that are in that area. So size of bubble in this context provides that secondary uh, information. And for more accuracy, you will use the bar graph uh, to represent uh, the numbers. And of course, this chart is also easily uh, replicable in Tableau. This is a copy that was done within Tableau, looks similar. Uh, the presentation is also similar as well. So likewise, if uh, again, in this example, if Switzerland is 9,796, so what is the rest of the, what is maybe Spain, for example? Likewise, if it's the bubble here, it's uh, 980. What is also the number for Spain in this case? Yeah, so also a quick guess. Yeah, so for this, there isn't a stats, but I will review the answers now. Yep, so Spain will be about 1,949 and the bubble here, it's about 23. Yep, so these are some of the pre-attentive attributes. Definitely there are some that's better than the other. So your goal when visualizing the data is to use the most effective one for your purpose. So if there is a certain uh, numbers that you want to uh, show, then uh, you it's best to use a certain type of charts. Mm -hmm. And here it shows us also, if you want a more accurate way of uh, showing the data, then it will be using the type of charts above here. Mainly you will notice is the good old uh, bar line charts and, and so forth that you're familiar with. And all the way down, uh, to look at secondary information, you could be using things like the volume, uh, the shades and the colors in order to, to do that. Yeah. So that doesn't mean you shouldn't use them. So if you're, it really, again, routes back to the first point, it depends on the goal. So you could utilize all these visual uh, cues, visual uh, attributes uh, in Tableau really, really easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. That's uh that's for the a bit of intro of what is about visual analytics. So next I will pass on to Ben to tell you more about the design and the best practices. Thanks, Jocelyn. Uh, I really like your sharing. It uh, reminds us all how impactful and how important uh, uh visual analytics is to us. But with 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 all good things, there is certain uh best practices that we have to keep in mind. Uh, because, you know, as human beings, we sense and perceive things uh, very uniquely, All right? So let me start off by uh, sharing with everyone um, what research tells us about data, All right? So there's basically three groups of data, right, uh, at a high level that we see, right? Firstly, it's uh, quantitative, as we can see here, some examples. All right, so let me see if I can get back on slide. All right, so we have quantitative uh, data, things, uh, data that we would um, uh, typically count, right, where the value is important. We have ordinal type of data where the, the order of the import of the data is uh, more important to us, such as uh, uh, gold, silver, and bronze, right, first, second, third kind of thing. And we have categorical kind of data, basically uh, ones that we know best, you know, names of places, uh, department names, uh, company names, right, addresses, they are all categorical data. But of these three groups of data, there is certain uh, factors of effectiveness that we can present this data in, right, such as position, color intensity, uh, shapes, sizes that, uh, you know, Jaslyn has sort of uh, touch upon and share uh, with you in, uh, in a few minutes ago. So let's deep dive into some of these ways of visualization to see how we can put into a certain best practice to make the effectiveness uh, more effective uh, and more impactful for our visualization. All right, we start off with orientation and position. 
right? So we got to remember uh, first and foremost that we should orientate our data so that people can read your visualization uh, more easily. Right. When we say read, it's uh, basically not actually reading of the numbers or the actual figures for a start, but at least the labels, right? And you know, you don't want the, the, the audience or the consumer of your dashboard to be having a you know a neck ache, right, or body ache, because they have to tilt their body or their head so that they can uh see the labels or read the chart. Right. So uh what you can do in this uh example is to uh, rotate your chart so to orient it so that people can uh, read the labels and the headings more easily. All right. Next, uh, that is related to orientation is of course uh, comparing of values. Right? I think this chart that you see here is uh, pretty common and you would find it familiar. Right, we see it in many kind of reports or even dashboards where users first thing is uh, they are still forced to read because the, the main bulk of the visualization is still the figures. Uh, there's certain visualization here, which is the, the, the circles, the arrows, and it is color uh, indicated. But what does color mean? What does the direction of arrows mean? Right? We are still leaving the users guess or to work it out. Right? So how can we make this better? Is probably with a bullet chart. All right, so the flexibility is there in platforms like Tableau to actually uh, try and work things out to get the best uh, visualization uh, for you to tell that story. Like Justin mentioned, right, you want to convey that message uh, in the shortest possible time so that uh, the consumers won't get frustrated. In this case, you can easily compare uh, actual versus targets and even uh, quickly visualize how far away from the target if they haven't Need it yet. Right, next we have is on aesthetics versus accuracy. All right, so uh, in this chart that we see here, or this visual that we see here, we have two pie charts. All right, something that uh, Justin has also mentioned, but uh, I think this pie chart is still quite okay. It's only a single slice. But the question is uh, which uh, slice, the one in beige color, uh, which one, the left or right, which uh, slice? is of a bigger cut, right? which has a bigger angle, or if I vice versa, which has a smaller angle. Right? It's, it's uh, pretty tough right, to see, and, and uh, the answer is the following. Let's see if I have the answer right here. Uh, and yeah, yes, we have. Right? So uh, the, 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 the point to learn about here is um, the, the choice to have between 2D and 3D charts. All right? So 3D charts are of uh, unique, there are some niche uh, use cases around that, but more often than not, you do not need them. In fact, 3D charts, if not used in the right way, will actually skew your view because the number of pixels that reaches your eye is uh, very different from a 2D uh, chart, right? Be it a pie chart or bar graph, right? Uh, more often than not, uh, you would just need a 2D. I guess uh, when you have a, a three point axis, something you want to see, you know, the gradient. Right, so uh, probably you may need a 3D kind of use case, but uh, as I say, it's a very niche use case. All right, the next next thing that we think about in terms of visualization is positioning of your data. All right, uh, I don't mean positioning of the chart, but in terms of the data points. All right, so it's a it's a it's a, um you can put put good use of this uh, technique to indicate specific clusters of interest. Right, or to find out, uh, to take a look if there's any outliers in your data. So this chart that we are very familiar with, the uh, Gartner Magic Quadrant, you can see uh, which are the outliers in each of the different quadrant depending on your uh, uh, focus, uh, interest of focus, all right? And that's Tableau right there. All right, so uh, still in line with the topic of position, we see this uh, infographic that uh, I think uh, we have come to be familiar with. And this infographic is talking about the history of pandemics, all right? Quite an interesting one. And some of you may have come across this a uh, few months back, uh, showing us the different uh, pandemics that has happened through uh, human history, right? And of course, the uh, COVID-19 is right up front there. But uh, what's interesting is the use of positioning of the different uh, uh, images on this infographic to show you the as a timeline, 
All right, so you don't really have to sort of uh, look at the nitty gritty uh, years uh, in terms of the timeline, the time frame there, but you, you straight away intuitively know that uh, the, the images that's further back, or in, in, in this case, it looks uh, further back, right, which is towards the top of the infographic, is actually in further back in history, whereas the images right in front gives you the perspective of uh, recent times, all right? So that's a good way of using uh, position. The next topic, uh, there's uh, one of my favorite in terms of the best practices uh, segment is all about colors. Right, so color is, uh, the color is perspective, right? Uh, you have to look at it in, uh, in terms of uh, where it's being used, the background and not really the absolute color. Right, so our eyes is easily uh, deceived. As of this case, are uh, the four uh, four squares of uh, the same shade of gray, or is one darker than the other? All right, so we are easily deceived because in this case the background is uh, skewing our view. All right, so if we put a border around uh, borders around these uh, four squares, you can easily confirm that all four squares are of the same shade intensity of gray, right? So do take note of the colors that you use, first and foremost. Uh, is it appropriate depending on the background, right? Especially if you are uh, working with infographics. This is a very good use case that I've came across, uh, trying to get users to focus on a certain data point in their dashboard or in their visualization. And um, in this uh, particular example, it makes uh, full use of certain uh, certain uh, techniques such as color, color intensity, enclosure, and of course size to help you focus on a certain point in this uh, uh, bubble chart. And in this case, is the city of Liverpool and the population within it. Right, so uh, Justin has mentioned in terms of uh, our short-term memory, how many numbers we can remember before we start forgetting the, the past. Uh, uh, same as, uh, very similar with colors, right? There's a certain number of colors that humans can distinguish at any one time, all right? Um, so I'm going to sp uh, spare you the anguish of, uh, uh, of uh, going quickly to Google or to try to guess this number. Uh, but you you do have the last few seconds to try to beat me to it. So the number of colors that humans can distinguish at any one time is only eight. All right, so do take note of that. Anything more than eight color uh, codings would uh, definitely start to confuse or stress uh, your users of the of the visualization. All right, so uh, with this example that you can see on the slide, this is uh, not very useful, I would say. Right, because the, the color coding does not really help to give more insight to the users. All right, whereas this other one that I've just changed into, we have uh, sort of apply uh, four colors, but the four colors is actually a uh, clustering of the data set to find out maybe certain uh, cluster of data that we want to focus on in terms of the outliers or the main cohort. All right, and this can be easily drag and drop and created in Tableau. So you want to have that flexibility to be able to control the colors that you use. So staying in the topic of color is color and coding. Make sure that whatever colors that you intend to use and differentiate does help to provide that additional insight, right? Uh, do not uh, add colors just because you want to uh, differentiate between uh, different categories. If you already labeled them, uh, for instance, uh, the picture on the right side of the slide right now, uh, then you don't really do have to bring in the concept of different colors because the labels clearly differentiate the different categories. Probably a better use of the color would be to use the color to, to, to uh, signify a, a different KPI. For instance, uh, the length of the bar is showing the sales, but uh, the, 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 the beige color bar that you see on the bottom left is now showing which category has a higher profit. So it makes it outstanding. Right, so do take note, uh, you know, on a related topic of your data to ink ratio, right? To use 
the absolute necessary colors to 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 convey your message to the audience right those colors that are just for aesthetics can be uh, taken out or reduced so that you get your users or whoever the, the consumers to focus so let's take a look at this example of this small little chart uh, and we we attempt to reduce the data to ink ratio right first step maybe we we, we take away the background color followed by which we only color the bar that we want to sort of present and highlight upon, right? In terms of maybe bacon has, in terms of the most calories per 100 grams, right? And maybe we can even uh, simplify it by taking out the, 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 the grid lines because if we bring out the labels, we don't even need the axis or grid lines, all right? So that really helps the consumers to be more targeted and understand your data story. Right. On the opposite side, if you do not take care of your data to ink ratio, you'll come across what we call as incongruent or obstructive chart junk. Right. Uh, uh, one famous example that I can uh, come up with is from our uh, the, the late Steve Jobs that we know. All right. So he's famous for his great presentation, and but one of his presentation, he does use a lot of unnecessary colors for his presentation. But nevertheless, still very impactful and uh, you know have a lots of impact on in terms of our uh, technology uh, advancement, right? Uh, there's another example, uh, two examples that I've shown on this slide. It's, uh, it's not too good use of colors and also images that uh, sort of uh, confuse and uh, you know, frustrate users because uh, you're not sure what to focus on and what is the main story that the dashboard is trying to, to convey to the, to the audience. Right, another activity for everyone to have some fun in, right? Can you spot a mistake, right? You know, on this slide. All right. So uh, I'll give uh, maybe a couple of seconds in light of time, right? Maybe uh, about five seconds. Four, three, two, one. All right. So the mistake is not in the numeric numbers nor the colors. The mistake is actually on the title. So I hope that you all had some fun there. Uh, typically in the classroom, I will have about 10% of the, of the participants being able to spot the mistake. So are you part of that 10%? All right, so uh, never forget that uh, there's a certain percentage of, our, of our, our colleagues or the population that, are, uh, that may be affected by color blindness. So do uh, avoid uh, colors that are sensitive to green, or, or red, especially because the majority of, of the uh, color blindness are affected by those color schemes. All right, so uh, do take note of the Tableau platform where we provide uh, certain best practices in terms of color schemes that's friendly to, to everyone, All right? But something to also take note in terms of colors is when you do use color palettes, uh, try to uh, use natural skills versus rainbow skills. Right, because natural skills are more accurately interpreted because it's more intuitive to us in terms of the intensity of color. Whereas rainbow skills, you know, you have multiple colors, but you still force users to read the legend. All right, so examples of uh, uh, natural skills are the following. You know, you can see on this slide you know, with a gradual change between either a single tone color or a two tone color, right? Both of which are good to convey the message in terms of the higher end number and the lower end number. Okay, so rounding off what we have learned so far, let's see some examples of a, a good example of how uh, uh, these uh, best practices designs can be put together to make an impactful visualization, right? And uh, we were going to see uh, also a, a poor design as well, right? So this particular chart is very uh, interesting. It's uh, first seen on the South China Morning Post. It's done by Simon Carr and it's a, a multi-award winning visualization as of what I've uh, found out, right? It shows the death, death from, of our soldiers from start to beginning of the US soldiers in Iraq, right? You can see each bar here, actually the length of the bar shows the, the number of deaths at a particular year in time of the war in Iraq, all right? And it paints a very green picture because it looks like blood flowing from top to bottom, right? And there's a lot of death in this chart. So let's, and, and it's titled Iraq's Bloody Toe. So let's see how we can sort of change the emotion and the tone of this dashboard by just changing a few of these 
free attentive visual attributes that Jaslyn had mentioned before as well. All right, so we're going to flip the chart around to orientate it. And the next thing I like to change is the color. So look at how does that actually change the mood and tone of the dashboard. Now it's not all too grim. In fact, it may look uh, like the like um, good times are coming, right? The death toll is hugely uh, decreasing over time, all right? And doesn't look like blood anymore. And just one more thing that we could change is, of course, if you have guessed it, is the title. So captions and titles, right? Don't forget them in your dashboards. It has a great impact on your story as well. In this case, you can change it that death is on the decline. And it, it now tells a very totally different, paints a different, totally different story as opposed to the initial uh, view that we saw. All right. So I just want to uh, speed up on to the poor example that I was uh, talking about. Nevertheless, it's a very interesting example. Let's, let me walk you through this uh, visualization called Colors in Culture. So the business question here is, what color do Asians associate with purity? Jocelyn, any guess what color? Why? <laughs> All right, that seems to be a good guess. Let's see how we can read this dashboard to be to be uh, to find out your answer. All right, so we want to find out um, Asians is uh, labeled with which letter? So it's the letter F. So we're going to mark that on the dashboard as well. That's the letter F right there. All right, so let's follow along the chart to uh, map it to priorities. Purity is at uh, the chart line 67, priority. All right, so right at the bottom there. So let's draw an arrow to map from the Asian purity. All right, so from the other F, we will draw an arrow to slide right down and you can see when it hits the column 67, the section 67 hits the color white. So bingo, right? Um, Justin has got the right answer. Did everyone else guess the right answer? So you can see how sort of uh, complex this chart, however nice it is. So do make better use of your colors and how, and try not to get your users uh, read the chart so much, all right? Or, or else they may, they may become frustrated, all right? So uh, one of my few final topics in terms of best practices is time and maps that we use so often, right? So uh, you know, visualizing time uh, since 1876, as we saw this, uh, as we can see from this example, uh, where you know, uh, people try to visualize the import and export from England, right? In and out of England, right? You can see that the visualizing time is uh, has not been much different since that time and now, right? So, uh, looking at how we would uh, visualize time right now is also through line charts, such as the example from the Financial Times talking about trade with Central Asian countries, and even locally, our uh, our very own LTA when we when they release information on the ridership uh, of the downtown line, right? They use similar charts to show the impact of that data, right? So visualizing time is not just about line charts, right? We can visualize uh, uh, time with what we call cycle plots easily by just uh, using the different date parts to look at trends within each month in your data set, right? Or uh, even down to really granular views of uh, hours, minutes, and seconds, right? You can, you can easily do that within the Tableau platform as well. So do check it out, right? And uh, with modern day uh, self-service visual analytics platform like Tableau, you can, you can sort of also put in uh, uh, time visualization of the step and jump lines. This is where the, the emphasis on is on the magnitude and duration of your data point, right? Typically, it's when, you know, uh, when the, the data changes abruptly instead of gradually. So maybe such a sort of a step and jump lines would, uh, would be more intuitive, all right? So uh, in terms of uh, visualizing time, it's not all about lines, right? We can use a highlight table to highlight certain uh, concentration of of, of data within a time frame, as you can see from these two examples, right? You can easily see the intensity of the color highlighting to us where the data is occurring higher in, all right? 
right? We can we can use maps to look at trends as well. This is one of uh, one of uh, the visualization that uh, my ex colleague has uh, done before. Very interesting to look at the is uh, based on the mock up data, I believe, on the on uh, the crime happening in terms in the different areas of Singapore. Right, you can see the trend is shown in on maps, but a series of map across a four year period. So that's very interesting. And then that's bring me to the topic of maps. All right. So use maps only when location is really, really relevant. All right. Don't use it when uh, the, the, the the location is uh, secondary. Right. So let's talk about where, uh, you know, if you have a one, uh, one measure or one KPI to, to sort of uh, analyze in the locations, it's fine to use uh, maps and fill it with the color intensity. All right. You can also use uh, the combination of size and color, right? To put in uh, multiple KPIs to analyze together, right? Even having each circle here, as you can see, on as a pie chart on the map, will help you uh, analyze uh, further rather than just a, a single number. But definitely don't use maps just because you have location information, right? Country information, state information, postal code. Use maps if location is important. If it's not, a lot of times, if the order of the data, right, which is more, which is less, is more important, then possibly uh, use the pie chart, right? Don't look down on the simplest of charts. Sometimes it is the best option. All right, so but mapping with Tableau, it does not always have to be geospatial, right? You could even what we call map on a digital image to help the users be, 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 be really engaged and make it really intuitive for them to know uh, what your data is talking back at them. All right, you can see from what well, this is one of the vis of the day of vis of the year uh, back in uh, uh, 2015 by Ryan Sleeper. All right, he, he uses uh, a mapping on digital image to talk about the cost of attending uh, uh, a baseball match back in the US, right? So this is a series of baseball matches uh, in, uh, in, in the US, and you can see how does the, the, the ticket prices differ as each match, uh, each uh, game goes along, all right? So very, very interesting and engaging visualization we have here, all right? And I'd like to end off with uh, talking about that is a metaphoric visualization. All right, so sometimes uh, uh, we may not use the best maps intentionally because we, we do want to mimic uh, certain things, right? So in this case, the topic here is talking about fast growing companies in America. And you know, the bubble chart that you see here, it may not convey all the data points very clearly, but it gives that very huge impact to the user looking at it because it looks like a petri dish of, of uh, bacteria or viruses that, that is uh, growing really fast. So we, they want to convey that message of company, there's many, many companies popping up and uh, growing in the industry. So how do you uh, fight in, in that space to keep your company the most relevant? So I think that this is a very, very interesting thing to think about as well. So with that, uh, Jace, I hope that uh, everyone has uh, enjoyed our session. Let's uh, sort of... Uh, do a uh, do a summary of uh, our presentation. All right, so a very quick recap of the entire session today uh, is really to remember that when we are presenting data, first of all, of course, we must remember who is our audience, not just by the roles, but also by their level of data literacy, if they can understand what you're trying to present. And of course, the main purpose of the information that you are trying to also present to your users. We have also looked at the cognitive uh, system and the concept of how things like chunking and how our short term memory works. We have also looked into the basic building blocks of uh, the charts and how to utilize those pre attentive attributes. Uh, what to avoid when we're talking about colors when Ben uh, talked about it earlier on. Yeah, so there's many different ways to present the same kind of information and there is no right or wrong. 
it purely depends on the purpose of the dashboards and the kind of information or even the feelings as one of the uh, infographic that Ben had also shown earlier, uh, the kind of feelings that you want to bring across to your audience. Yeah, so with that, I hope you have enjoyed today's uh, session uh, for the science of visual analytics. I hope it opens up your mind and your eyes to uh, this visual concept and I uh, hope you are more receptive also to seeing data in a more visual manner. So I really hope to see everyone face to face next time as well. So hope everyone can stay safe and I will see you uh, soon. Bye. Bye.